Hi, I'm Rosie Claverton. I'm a crime novelist who lives in Cardiff. And today I'm going to talk about five ways that writers add realism. First off, the devil is in the details. And in this particular case, I'm talking about describing people. First, I like to start with the broad brushstrokes. Skin colour, hair colour, build, height, anything to pick someone out of a lineup. Then what about those smaller things? I don't suggest you describe every tiny thing about a person, though some readers like that. Maybe instead pick out those significant little bits. Uh, does the person got close cropped hair, for example? Is it dyed? Do they wear makeup? Do they wear jewellery? How have they done their nails? What do they do? Small parts of behaviour are really important and can give a lot away about a person. So, for example, I often talk with my hands. I like to gesture a lot. Sometimes if I have a pen, I'm flicking around in my fingers. This tells you a lot about me. Also, when I'm doing something like this, I'm holding my hands together under the table to stop myself doing that, which again can give you a lot of details about someone, about their energy. Or maybe someone who's more slumped or hunched over in a chair can tell you a little bit about them as well. Also, what things are missing. So, for example, someone might have a tan line where they used to wear a watch. Where's it gone? Same with rings or missing rings. What things might you expect to see on a person that you're not seeing? These things can really add flavour to a description. What you might want to do is pick one or two significant things that give you a lot of shorthand about someone. So, for example, you might say, oh, they have very short, bitter nails, which might tell you a lot about their mental state or how anxious they are. The other thing that you can think about is how they interact with their space or the people around them. Are they ducking their head? Are they making good eye contact? Are they really larger than life and taking up a lot of space in the room? One of the things that I find really useful about this, because description is something I struggle with, is looking at large groups of people, meeting lots of people and seeing how they move. Because sometimes we can get really familiar with the small group of people that we count as part of our friends and family. After the pandemic, this is a particular challenge. Going out into the world again, seeing how people move, refreshing how we feel about it. I have heard from people and I felt myself a little bit of apprehension when I read in a novel or see on TV a scene with lots and lots of people. Um, and there's something about that. How people move in a crowd is really important or how people are by themselves. One of the things that you can also think about is the perspective a novel is written in. So in a third person perspective, even if it's what's called a deep third, you're still having a bit of distance from the characters. Whereas if you've got a first person narrator, you might not have an outright unreliable narrator, but that person is still choosing how they present themselves to the reader. And so as a writer, you're trying to work out how best to present them. What are they hiding? What are they disclosing? What things might you reveal along the way? What things might they say accidentally? Maybe an anger or high emotion. These are all things that add to the picture. Secondly, what about describing the scene? So I am here in my study. Um, you can see probably quite a lot of reflections in the windows. Um, you can also see my cup of tea, which is going cold. I better drink it. But what you might not be able to see is that this is the mug. And that probably tells you something about me. Here, I have a cake, not yet eaten. Is that because I've got distracted and I haven't finished it yet? Or am I saving it for a reward? There's a book here. Maybe I'm reading it. Maybe it's actually my book. And again, that probably tells you quite a bit about me. And then in the background here, you have a children's toy and a stress toy. Are they mine? Do they belong to someone else in the house? Again, what might that tell you? Again, maybe in a description of a scene, you wouldn't want to focus on all of those details. You might want to pick one or two little things. So 
What's more important? I am a fan of describing hot drinks in my novels. So you'll often find out if someone's got a cup of tea um, pretty often, and most of the time they do. But, you know, what's the significance of the toy, for example? So you might focus that in your description. So is it a particularly sentimental toy? Is it just been discarded here? Is it for a child who's not here? Is it for me? Do I find it particularly comforting in some way? Do I just love dinosaurs? Spoilers, I do love dinosaurs. But what are these tiny details telling you about the flavour of the scene? This is really important. Thirdly, try and visit places. So description of places is my absolute nemesis. I am rubbish at it. I'm not a very visual spatial person when it comes to big spaces. So a lot of locations in my novels, particularly houses and apartments, are based on places I've actually been to. So in my first novel, I based them on lots of places where my friends lived, places that I had lived, um, because I get a better feel for the space. And having actually walked the boards, having actually lived there, you get a very strong feeling for what bits are important to describe. Um, same for, for bigger spaces. So when I'm writing in Cardiff, I find it much easier when I'm writing other places. So Cardiff Central Station is a place I've spent a lot of time over the years, and I find it very easy to describe. Um, same with the, the National Museum in Cardiff. Uh, I find that a very easy place to describe. And when I'm struggling, I find it very easy to visit. When I haven't been able to go to places, I tend to use a combination of Google Street View and trying to ask people who actually live and work in that area what it's like. Because again, getting that personal perspective really helps uh, bring the reader into the story. When I need really specific knowledge, we're kind of coming to point four now, which is to, to ask experts. So one of the things that I have to recognise is that I have limitations. As an author, I have some personal experience, the old write what you know stuff. Um, and then otherwise, I really have no idea. I have never murdered someone. So I don't have a lot of experience about that. But also, I have found little areas of my novel where I need extra help. One of my favourite um, pieces of research was in my third book, uh, Capture Thief. I was trying to work out where a little smuggling boat would land um, uh, on Anglesey. And I had a look at lots of maps, I had a look at kind of like sailing forums and information, and I just couldn't work it out. I've, I've been to Anglesey, but I'm not a sailor, so it was lost on me. So I contacted the Hollyhead Coast Guard, and they were very obliging and told me uh, a very good location to land a little smuggling boat, um, which was very kind of them, and, and I think adds to the scene. So while I've not been to that place, I had a, a local expert description of, of where it, um, where the boat could go, how the scenery would look, and I think that really added to it. But that brings me to point five, which is you're never going to be perfect. And actually, the more important thing is for the book to feel real. What you're looking for is something that, that feels authentic, that immerses the reader in the situation, even if it's not 100% accurate. I'm terrible for this because uh, I'm a doctor and I hate, hate watching medical dramas. I hate reading about doctors. I despise all of it because it's never right. And I can't set aside that part of me to not nitpick over it. And um, I've heard from a lot of my friends who have other professions um, that this is a similar thing. But you're not always writing for the experts. One of the things uh, that I've also found, one of the things that sometimes annoys me more, in fact, than people are getting it wrong, is really over describing scenes and I remember a, a notable author's scene uh, about an operating theatre when I was just irritated by the sheer number of details 
I was thinking, this surgeon is not going to be thinking about this. This is not what you're thinking about. Because for the surgeon, this is an everyday occurrence. This is an everyday environment for him. So what he's going to be thinking about is what's out of place? What's different about today? What am I leaning into? What music am I listening to? What's happening with this particular patient? Which nurses are here today? The rest of the operating theatre is just set dressing. It's background. It's deep background because this is somewhere he lives every day. And again, when you're talking about perspective, what the person, what the narrator is noticing is equally as important as what's sitting in the background. So I feel that you need enough colour and information to tell the reader something about the place if they've never been somewhere similar. But also don't get bogged down in those details. Don't over describe. And uh, again, readers' experiences may vary. Some people really love that really lush, rich, exploratory description. I feel that generally in crime fiction, you're looking for more action or you're looking for a cosy feeling or you're looking for more immersion in in the story that's not necessarily that more more lush dwelling description that you might get in literary fiction for example. So that is my whistle stop tour of five ways that writers add realism. So the devil is in the details, especially around people. Make sure you set your scene. And point three, make sure you visit places, or if not, use Google Maps. Uh, local knowledge is really important, so seek out experts. And the feeling is the most important thing at the end of the day. Thank you so much for joining me.